God's final call to the world, otherwise known as Earth's final warning. The loud cry that comes from heaven. And isn't it amazing? This prophecy again lifts its head and we can see how you can, according to God's will, look into the future and be able to understand things that are not recognizable at the time. I love these prophecies. I love being able to study the word and understand that certain things are still to take place. But how many things have already gone before us? We are living in amazing times, absolutely incredible times. And here we can recognize 1844 as a date when Satan is going to start in and around that period, his final attack to unify the world. And what happens exactly on time? Certain things happen, the Baha'i faith, the evolution, and all these things start to lift themselves up in the world. Well, before I start the second half of this lecture, I just need to pause and apologize to my Australian colleagues and friends because they've corrected me again. They've told me it's not Azazel, it's Azazel. Now, I don't think I use Azazel's name anymore in the lecture, so if you rewind and you find Azazel and you don't know who that is, just refer to Azazel if you don't mind, please. Well, let's continue on. Here, we're looking now into the future, and we see what is going to take place from here on forwards. We know that certain things have happened, but now look at these various video clips that I'm going to show you and just figure out for yourself, how close are we really to the end? Here, there's a, in 1844, Christ goes into the Holy of Holies in the heavenly sanctuary to go and minister on our behalf, to go and do the ceremony of atonement where we can once again become at one with God. And when he leaves the sanctuary, wow, man, there's going to be momentous, momentous things that happen on this earth. But before we get there, Satan still has to unify the earth under this idea of unity in error, unity in compromise. You cannot stand on any fundamental principles. You cannot believe anything that puts you out in the open. The same as what psychology takes an average or the mean of everybody and works out what the average is and you have to somehow fit into the middle. Somehow you either, this, this is the idea that's filtering through the new world order and this one world system where everybody just has to fit into sort of an average. And your religion you don't have the legal right anymore. Shortly, you, we won't have the legal right anymore to be able to say, but I can't bow down to any other God except Jesus Christ. In its entirety, not with any relationship towards or relation towards sun worship. I cannot do that because if, uh, if sun worship infiltrates my religion, I'm going to receive the mark of the beast. And yet, in their millions, people are, being drawn into recognizing the papacy as the head of all churches, not only of the Christian churches, but of all the world's religions. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. We saw in 1986, in the previous lecture, I showed you the clip from 1986, where all the world's leaders, the religious leaders of the world came together in Assisi. Well, in 1999, three years later, this, uh, 19, uh, yeah, 1999, three years later, the same thing happened. Except this time it was even bigger and some profound things were said at this, uh, at this occasion. Dr. Kathy Burns explains, As reported in the Associated Press with the Dalai Lama sitting by his right side, this October 1999 in Rome, the Pope presided over a special council of some 2,000 religious leaders at various faith sects and cults. The pontiff told the assembled Buddhists, Buddhist monks, Zoroastrian priests, Catholic cardinals, Hindu gurus, American and Indian shaman, Jewish rabbis, and ecumenical clergy that all must join in condemning the Christian fundamentalists who abuse speech and whose efforts are converting others to incite hatred and violence. So by acknowledging Jesus Christ as your only savior, you will be seen as inciting hatred and violence. And we will be seen as Christian fundamentalists that abuse speech. Isn't that incredible? Where standing on the word was the thing to be recognized as standing on the truth. The truth is now being made error. And the Christian fundamentalists are going to be blamed for inciting hatred and invoking terrorism. 
The Bible believers denounced at the Bible Conference Power of the Prophecy in March 2000 says the following. All present were in one accord on two key points. Here we go. Number one, John Paul II was endorsed as consensus as the planet's chief spiritual guide and overseer. And number two, religious fundamentalists who refuse to go along with the global ecumenical movement are to be silenced. They must be denounced as dangerous extremists full of hate. So not only are they recognizing that there's this element of Christianity that refuses to go along, but they call myself and people that stand with me and others, all these people that are be believing in the Bible and the Bible alone, they call us religious or dangerous extremists that are full of hate. Have a look for a moment at this video clip and ask yourself, did you allow, or if, if you were to ask yourself the question, ask yourself, did I ask for the Pope to be made the chief spiritual overseer of the whole planet? Well, I know that I certainly didn't. Why then are all these religious leaders doing this on your behalf? And bowing down to the Pope. Have a look at this for a moment. Did you ask for that to take place? I didn't. So certain things are being done on our behalf. This one was at the Vatican. The previous one was at Assisi. This is at the Vatican under the symbol of the sun, that obelisk which has been put bright lights on it that you could see it brightly. And they're all carrying little uh, um, candles. And then you see where she lights or where the candle is lit. There's these three candles in, in one, the three lights, the trinity, got to do with this false trinity that we've explained over and over. Well, this was done in 1999. Can you see how close we are? All these world religions are recognizing that they actually are the same thing. Well, that's excluding the true fundamental Christians, of course. We believe that Jesus Christ is the only God and that there is no other name under heaven by which man can be saved except the man Jesus Christ. This is a big problem in the world because today we're the people that are identified as God's children are going to be almost exposed as it were. We'd stand out like a sore thumb. World Goodwill Letter says, The day is dawning when all religions will be regarded as emanating from one great spiritual source. All will be seen as unitedly providing the one root out of which the universal world religion will inevitably emerge. Then there will be neither Christian nor heathen, neither Jew nor Gentile, but simply one great body of believers gathered out of all current religions. That's Alice A. Bailey that's writing that. The woman who says that she's got no other life intention except for waiting for the coming one, who in the previous lecture we identified as Lucifer. She continues when she says uh, even more on the subject about this one world religion, where you have to compromise Jesus Christ to come down onto the same level as all the others. She says, Thus the expect aims and efforts of the United Nations will be eventually brought to fruition and a new church of God gathered out of all religions and spiritual groups will unitedly bring to an end the great heresy of separateness. The great heresy of 
separateness. The world is coming together and there's these people that are standing separate and they're saying, no, 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 I'm sorry, I can't do that. I've got to compromise my principles. Well, the United Nations will become one of the leading proponents of removing those who stand as heretics in their separateness. That's what she's writing. Robert Miller said, the world's major religions must speed up dramatically their ecumenical movement and recognize their unity or the unity of their objectives in diversity of their cults. My religion, right or wrong, and my nation, right or wrong, must be ad abandoned forever in the planetary age. This idea of standing separate must be removed. We're coming together. Everything's coming together. A former New Ager, Randall Bayer, states that those who refuse the mark of the beast will be targeted for extermination in what would euphemistically be called re-education centers of love and relocation, that is, death camps in disguise. Now, all I want to do now is I want to warn you about what we're going to be showing from now on. Not, vi not visually, but exposing you to things which are going to happen in future. The Bible warns about times that have never been before. And the, in history, we can see that there have been some pretty shocking things. And then s in the Bible, it warns about all the nations will bow down to the beast and wonder after what this Roman beast is speaking about. Not only that, we can, we can see how all the religions are coming together, the world economics, etc., etc., etc. And the people who stand out must be removed, it says. How are they going to be removed? This idea of death camps, is that an option? Well, unfortunately it is. The people who stand separate in the world, stand on the Bible and the Bible alone, are going to become more and more exposed. And that's why I say I don't know how long I'm going to be able to do these lectures for. Once the Lord has used me up, then... He'll use whatever means he has to. He can use a donkey. He can use stones if he has to. He'll use you to get this message out. But understand that by taking this message out, you are going to be standing separate and outside of the unity of this world religion that they're speaking about. Satan is busy putting together plans to unite this entire earthly kingdom under his power. Alice A. Bailey, when she quotes about the same thing, about this one world religion and this new world order, this one world coming together unity, she speaks about a Templeton Prize winner who says that man must change or perish. So this idea of death camps, is it me making it up? No. Let me show you. Here's a graphic of a document which has been put together at the Congress of the United States, the House of Representatives, March 24th, 1997. You'll see it signed by Bill Hefner, the member of Congress. And it says, enclosed is the information you requested pertaining to the Army's policy and guidance for establishing civilian inmate labor program and civilian prison camps on Army installations. This information has not yet been published. However, it has been funded, staffed, and does reflect our current Army policy. These camps exist. They already exist. They say there's over 600 of them, the people that are watching this. There's, there's people that are actually going around and um, taking photographs of these places. Here's a couple of them. And notice for a moment that the, the um, fully staffed and fully armed and fully guarded institutions all have their fences facing inwards to keep people in, not outwards to keep people out. Here's two graphics. You can see the watchtower and the camps at the bottom. There's another one at the bottom. These places are all over, not only America, but all over the world, standing empty, but fully guarded and just waiting for people to arrive. Something is about to take place. Something, oh man, the tribulation is coming as, of, uh, as has never been seen in the world before. A new inquisition states the following. Dr. Adler, chairman of the board of editors of the Encyclopedia Britannica, he would know what he's talking about, He's also the director of the, in, of the Institute for Philosophical Research in Chicago and the chairman of the Padaya Project and an honorary trustee of the Aspen Institute. Now he says the following. Simply stated, Adler argues that we will not be able to attain world peace until we attain cultural unity. But Adler argues that there is one obstacle to this unity, Christianity. Adler's point is simple. Christianity claims supernatural knowledge and divine revelation. And this is divisive and not open to rational debate. This should not be tolerated. Here it is. 
Same problem. Those Christians, those people that are fundamental and standing on, as Billy Graham said, people that take a stand and won't let go of it, those people must be removed because I've come to love all religions, as he says. The problems of humanity. The Christian churches, writes Rothschild in Reality and Illusion, must also kill out all separativeness and learn to cooperate with all the other faiths whose scriptures are of equal value and beauty as the New Testament. All of the faiths have to come together. They've all their documents are as beautiful as the New Testament. I disagree, profoundly disagree, in fact, and because, quite frankly, they're not. Because my New Testament speaks about the only God that can save me, and that's Jesus Christ. Dr. Christopher Hyatt refers to Christian fundamentalists as the shadow emerging in society. He predicted, however, that the fundamentalist forces will be overcome. There will be a change of the gods. Hyatt went on to reveal just how this changing of the gods will take place. I see, he stressed, that the earth still requires some blood before it is ready to move into new and different areas. I see the new age required a lot of blood, disruption, chaos, and pain for, the mass, for a mass change to occur. Here's one of the high ups saying something about these fundamentalists are standing in the way. This is the shadow creeping into mankind, this into society, a shadow emerging, these Christian fundamentalists. But for this big change to take place, which is the final new world order and the coming together of these world religions, a lot of blood still has to flow. Alice A. Bailey in her book, a Re The Reappearance of the Christ, she says, there must be no distress over the disappearance of the old order. The good, the true, and the beautiful is on its way. And for it, mankind is responsible, not some outer divine intervention. My Bible says the opposite, though. In John 16, verse 2, it warns about the, the coming tumultuous times when uh, mankind will be so confused that they will be doing what seems to be right, but they will actually be falling into the hands of the Antichrist. Not only by worshipping and doing things which is not according to God's will, but they will be killing other people and they'll be, doing th they'll be thinking that they're doing God a service. Can you imagine how confused you have to be to get to the point where you're killing other people? Read this text with me, R uh, John 16 verse 2. It says, They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will th think that he doeth God a service. That's confusion, utter confusion. There will be so many lies in the world that they will be convinced that these Christian fundamentalists need to be removed and they'll be doing God a service because they're standing in the way of this unity and this day. The, there'll be a day chosen on which we have to worship as an entire worldwide community will be chosen and then these people will say, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I'll get into that in the next lecture. But for the moment here, John 16, 33 says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace, in the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. It's through Jesus Christ that we find salvation, not through some one world unified God. Read this quote. A period of extreme tribulation and unprecedented misery is soon to cover the entire world. All events coming to light are pointing directly towards the end. Such wholesale destruction of the undesirable elements from the surface of the earth comes to the effect, into effect at different places through different causes. It may be through storms and flood, through famine and disease, through wars, through massacres, or through heavenly calamities like volcanic upheavals. There should be enormous bloodshed all over the world. And lo the loss of life through various causes shall be so great that the world population shall be considerably reduced. The older order shall be changed and a new order shall be born. Plans are underway, like is explained in Daniel 12 verse 1, that there will be times of trouble as have never been seen on the earth before. There's even plans to reduce the population how many people have to die if you are going to reduce the population you see how how important this new age agenda is because the people right at the top of the new age system they're the ones that are planning all this stuff where i got involved in the new age just thinking i would try and create affluence and influence and wealth and success for myself and i got sucked into something that i had no idea what it was part of the new ages 
are the ones who are responsible for setting up this one world system whereby they can maintain the population to a certain level. Author John Randolph Price, author of The Super Beings, plainly identifies Christians in this statement. There are some groups who continue to cling to the absurd idea that man is a miserable sinner and a worm of the dust. He also notifies us that two and one half billion people will be killed. New Age and humanist John Dunphy uh, refers to the Christian Christianity as a rotting corpse. It's us fundamentalists which they're going to be targeting. It's the people that say, excuse me, the Bible warns me about prophecy. It says, it warns me to uh, read prophecy and understand what's going to happen. And I don't agree with what you're doing. And they say one and a half billion people, that's a lot of people. It gets even bigger because Wanda Mars explains that Ted Turner, chairman of the Better World Society, called Christians bozos and losers. Not only does he call Christians bozos and losers, this quote says that he said, a total world population of 250 to 300 million people, that's what he wants. In other words, a 95% decline from present levels would be ideal. Ted Turner the founder, owner of Time Warner, of CNN and all those big companies. He's speaking about a 95% reduction in world population. How many people has he, are they planning to get rid of then? Well, you first, Ted. If you want to reduce the population, I'll tell you what, let's start with you. You see, this is not just some airy-fairy story where people are getting together and saying, well, it would be nice to have a, a population of such and such, you know even though I've shown you in the previous lectures that overpopulation is a fallacy. It's not that they just are coming up with an idea of control in it. This is actually written in stone. If you don't know about it, have a look at this image. These are the Georgia Guidestones. And then on there you see the Georgia Guidestone center cluster erected March 22, 1980. Let these be Guidestones to an age of reason. Now an age of reason was a book that was written by Thomas Paine. Its intent was to destroy the Judeo-Christian beliefs upon which the United States Republic was founded. These Georgia Guidestones are referring specifically to the age of reason. This is the removal of the Christian fundamentalist principles of America and in, in uh, backing that the rest of the world. On these Guidestones, chopped in stone, what is chopped in stone? What ten rules do we have in the world at the moment that were given by God that were chopped in stone. The Ten Commandments, right? Does it sound now, here's another uh, set of ten rules, if you like, or ten guidelines that have been chopped into stone on these Georgia guidelines. On one of the highest hilltops in Albert County, Georgia, stands a huge granite monument engraved in eight different languages on the four granite st or giant stones that formed and that support the common capstone are the Ten Guides or commandments. That monument is alternatively referred to as the Georgia Guidestones or the American Stonehenge. Read the commandments with me. They say, maintain humanity under 500,000 in perpetual balance. I don't know who figured out that's perpetual balance, but they say that we have to have only half a billion people. Number two, guide reproduction wisely. Number three, unite humanity with a living new language, etc., etc. Does this sound familiar now? that there's this one world order coming and that there actually are plans inside the new age people and with other people as well to remove from the population in the billions of people. Daniel 2 verse 44 says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kings and it shall stand forever. Ellen White writes the following. She says, Oh, that we might see the needs of these cities as God sees them. At such a time as this, every hand is to be employed. The Lord is coming and the end is near. Yea, it hasteth, hasteth greatly. In a little while we shall be unable to work with the freedom we now enjoy. Terrible scenes are before us and what we do we must do quickly. She continues, impending destruction the time is near when large cities will be swept away and all should be warned of these coming judgments. You see why this is a loud cry that comes from heaven about Babylon that's fallen has fallen? There's a warning 
in, in the time of Israel and Egypt where the Israelites were corned out, there was a warning that went out, please Pharaoh, let the people go. You will not let my people Shabbat. You won't let my people rest. Let them go. Let them come out of Israel. And then what happened when he said no? He received some plagues. I'm going to get into that now. That's the typology of the end. Revela uh, Daniel 7 verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Here's the acknowledgement of this one world order. The Lord comes and says, no, you might do it for a while, but boom, here comes the destruction. And in line with that, the, the, the Pope is seen as the leader of this ecclesiastical community. He's seen as the leader of all world religions. Even so that they sing hymns to him, all nations will bow and worship before you, O Lord. That's what they say. You don't believe me? Watch this clip. It was great. A great feeling of it was a great excitement, great peace. of peace, U unity. of love, peace, love, and unity. Unity. Yes. Unity? Yes. before you, O Lord. Can you see the prophecy being fulfilled? The Bible warns over and over and over again about worshipping the beast and by doing so, following or worshipping the dragon. And now you don't have to worship the Pope like these people are doing. All you have to do is acknowledge his authority and by doing so, you are bowing down to the authority of the Roman Catholic system. Revelation 13 verse 12 says, And he causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. Verse 15 says, Worship the image of the beast. 14 verse 9 says, Worship the beast. 14 verse 11 says, Who worship the beast in his name. Worship is the problem. It's not about power and money. It's about worship. It's about bowing down to authority. And what is the final confrontation going to be all about? How will they be able to determine exactly who's the exclusive group and who are the inclusive group? How will they be able to know that these people have to be removed and be, be detained and be, uh, uh, they're the heretics of separateness, as they say? Worship is the problem. The worship of Satan through the system of sun system worship that is placed on earth, of which the head of this is the Pope. Revelation, verse, Revelation 13, verse 2 to 4, say the following. And all the world wandered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon, which gave power to the beast, and they worshipped the beast. There are momentous times lying ahead. We've come from way in history, and we've brought it up to where we are today. We're looking into the future and we can see that things are being developed and plans are being developed, which are uh, scary. Not only that, we look right currently in the news to see whether what is going on can actually be true. And the more we hear, the more we hear noises about the Pope taking on this role of the leader of the world. Not only is he acknowledging himself as the leader, he says in, in, uh, on CNN that the Vatican says that non-Catholics are wounded by not recognizing the Pope. 
It says the Vatican text, which restates the controversial document Dominus Iesus, issued by the then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger in 2000, said that the church wanted to stress this point because some Catholic theologians continue to misunderstand it. The document stressed that only Catholicism had all the elements to be the Christ's church fully. That's the noise that over and over this is being made. In 2000, Cardinal Ratzinger said, this is the only church. In 2007, Pope Benedict says, this is the only church. On the 10th of July, this is not even a month ago, he states the following, Christians, not true churches. 10th of July, 2007. Just read those top couple of lines. Pope Benedict has reass reasserted the universal primacy of the Roman Catholic Church. Approving a document released Tuesday that says orthodoxy churches were defective and other Christian denominations were not true churches. You see, you aren't a true church if you don't have your own DNA source. Inside your system, if you were to do a, a paternity test on your religious system, if it's, say, let's just use Christianity. If you were to do a paternity test inside Christianity, could you find any links? between what you currently use as your system of worship and Rome? Would you be able to find any links? Well, the whole of Christianity bows down on which day? The day of the sun. And Rome says, I changed the day. It's my day, my mark of authority. So we would have to look at that as well. At the same time as the Pope is making these noises about becoming the world's uh, supreme spiritual leader and that Christian churches have to acknowledge him as the primacy, at the same time that he's making that, he reboots, as it were, the Latin Mass. He wakes it up. It's a dormant Mass. It has never been taken out of the way. But this Latin Mass is founded in the principles of the, the 1500-16th century in opposition to the Reformation. The Latin Mass, as we've seen through these lectures, is this... Th this uh, the language and the, the, the ceremony that was put in place in opposition of the Reformation. And now, after Vatican II, when it was made to sort of go into quiet submission, now he reboots it in all earnestness as it was before. He says, after months of intense speculation, Pope Benedict XVI has eased restrictions on the Catholic Church's traditional Latin Mass. The decree called motto proprio, proprio, which means a personal initiative of the pontiff, was made public Saturday. Benedict's ruling authorizes parish mm, priests to celebrate the Tridentine rite, as it's known, without needing their bishop's permission. His explanatory letter states, what earlier generations held sacred remains sacred and great for us too. What was held sacred to the people of the Inquisition of the 1600s, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, and later? The Inquisition, the people that were fighting and removing the heretics, the people that were burnt at the stake because they believed in the Bible. And now that same ritual, the, land, the Tridentine Mass, the Tridentine Rite is raised to the fore. And then Benedict says, what was sacred to previous generations is sacred to us. In other words, this beast hasn't changed. A leopard can't change its spots. This beast doesn't change. Throughout history, it's done the same. And now we've just gone into different marketing ways. Now it's going underneath and these slimy legs are encircling the globe. We're coming back and there's going to be a group that stand out and say, I'm sorry, I can't be part of that. And that inquisition, the persecution will be done again on the backing of the Latin Mass. Unbelievable. These are historic times. If we had done this presentation 10 years ago, we would have s I would have had to... Um, predict that these things would take place. 20 years ago, I would have been called a lunatic. Today, I say, look, it's history. It's just in the news. Just look around you. Remember George Bush said, the best way to honor Pope John Paul II, truly one of the great men, is to take his teaching seriously, is to listen to his words and to put his words and teachings into action here in America. This is a challenge we must accept. The persecution which is going to come from the inquisition for these, these heretics that stand outside of the unified church, the persecution that takes place on them is going to be fulfilled through America. That is just a fulfillment of prophecy. 
It's incredible how these things are coming together. Ephesians 4 verse 13 and 15 say, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. You see, there's only one God. There's only one place where we are safe. There's only one Savior, not some conglomerate, compromised whatever of religion. There's one God. And if you believe that and you don't, can't compromise on that fact, you're in trouble. God wants unity, as he explains in Ephesians 4.13. He wants unity, but it's unity in truth, not unity in error. That's why he says in, in 2 Peter, he speaks, God is, not, is, is long-suffering. He's not slack concerning his promise. He's long-suffering so that not everyone would come to repentance and that all may be saved. Revelation 18, verse 9 and 10. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. This man, there's a times coming ahead this is all leading up to the final events of the world where the rapture says you won't have to go through this boom you're going to be taken away the bible says no that's not true you're going to have to go through this but god will be with you ellen white says thus the substance of the second angel's message is again given to the world by the other angel who lightens the earth with his glory these messages all blend in one to come before the people in the closing days of this earth's history all the world will be tested. Nobody will be raptured away. All the world will be te tested. And all that have been in darkness of error in regard to the Sabbath of the fourth commandment will understand that last message of mercy that is to be given to men. I want to run through the final events as they will take place. But not all of them. Just the antitype of the type as it was in the days of Israel coming out of Egypt. Revelation 15 verse 1 says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Here, right at the end of time, comes the same outpouring of plagues as was in uh, the time of Egypt, except it's not the same plagues, there's different aspects to it, we'll get into that now. But the Bible always gives you an example and then shows you what's going to happen. It, it, it speaks about the plagues in, in is Egypt because he wants you to come out and be separate. And Israelites, they had to come out and be separate. At the end of time, there's some plagues that are going to hit this false worship system and, and, and the entire world as it, and then come out of her, my people, and be separate. Revelation 16 verse 1. And I heard a great voice of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. What are these plagues? The first went and poured out the vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. The first plague to hit mankind at the end will be sores, boils, maybe some sort of terribly terribly painful sore and hospitals will be full of these people not knowing where this comes from i don't know what's going on why why is this happening because they haven't heard or been able to receive the truth in its entirety because it's been covered up there's a warning going into the world be careful the plagues are coming the first one will be the sores the the these boil type things that carries on in verse three and the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. Can you imagine that? Imagine going to the coast and looking out and there's just this red blood bath in front of you. No fish, no animals in the sea. Everything's dead. What about the third plague? Revelation 16 verse 4. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of waters and they became blood. Even the drinking water becomes blood. There's nothing for people to drink. Nothing for people to drink. Do you know how thirsty we're going to get? You have to drink blood. 
See, Babylon is the one that took the blood of the saints and she's the one with the cup of the wrath of her indignation. indignation. And now, now it's given back. And they say, well, you wanted to drink of the blood, now drink of the blood. Revelation 16 verse 5. Thou art righteous, O Lord, because thou hast judged us. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and thou hast given them blood to drink. You see? Bread, according to Isaiah 33, verse 16, bread shall be given to him, and his waters shall be sure. There'll be people that won't have anything to drink, but God's people, they'll have food and they'll have to drink. So if you stand on the right side, God will be with you. He'll protect you as he did in the plagues in Egypt. He'll protect you as you, the plagues come on the, end, the, uh, the earth in the end time. What about the fourth plague? Revelation 16 verse 8. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun and powder was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God which has power over these plagues and they repented not to give him glory. So the sun gets hot and starts to burn people up. What about the fifth plague? Notice where the fifth plague hits. Very, very important. Revelation 16 verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out, poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast and his kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of the pains and their sores and they repented not of their deeds. Do you notice here that the plague, this plague specifically hits the seat of the dragon? In other words, the Vatican, the Roman system, the seat of Romanism. These plagues are not universal. These plagues are not universal. They are targeted into specific areas, mostly in the cities. It's not a universal plague. And that's why there's a call, come out of her and be separate, that you receive not of her plagues. You see, come out and be separate. What about the sixth plague? Revelation 16 verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. And the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to that battle of that great day of God Almighty. And he gathered them together in a place in, uh, called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. But Armageddon is supposed to be the third world war? No. Armageddon forms part of the sixth plague. It's not some uh, third world war that uh, might still happen. We're not sure. But Armageddon specifically has to do with the sixth plague being poured out. What about the seventh plague? And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightning and there was a great earthquake and every island fled away and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. The seventh plague is hail coming down from heaven in huge blocks that destroy absolutely everything. Not only that, you get earthquakes and Islands flee away. We saw in the evolution lecture, I showed you how islands were fleeing away just from one storm. But here, islands and mountains disappear. This earthquake turns the, the mountain ranges like the Alps and the, the, the massive uh, mountain ranges, turns, uh, turns them to liquid. Can you imagine the times? Wow, it's going to be amazing. And in the I time of the Israelites, what did they have to do to be secure from the plagues? Put the blood of the lamb over their doorposts. In the time of the end, what do we have to do to be secure from the plagues? Put the blood of the lamb over the doorposts of your soul. See the type and the anti-type? We have to, each one of us, put our sins inside the sanctuary that since 1844 the process of cleansing of the sanctuary can be fulfilled. That our sins are removed and put on a zazel. And not only that, we have to take the blood of the lamb and put the blood of the lamb over the doorposts of our soul, that we can be identified as those that stand separate and in unity of truth in opposition to the masses that stand in unity of error. Psalm 91 verse 1. 
He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in the darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right, but it shall not come nigh to thee. Only with thy eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the, the most high thy habitation. There shall no evil before thee, neither shall any plague come thy, nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee. Isn't that beautiful? That passage explains exactly what's going to happen. Right at the end of time, when the plagues fall and the mankind is in turmoil, the Lord says, you're going to see what's going on. Don't think you're going to be raptured away from it. Please don't be fooled by that. You're going to see what's going on, but I'll protect you. Under my wings, because you found habitation inside me in the rock of ages, I'll protect you through these things. But man, it's going to be shaken. Times that will shake us to the core. Jude 14 and verse 15 say, Behold, the Lord came with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all. And convict all the ungodly of their works of ungodliness, which they have ungodly wrought, and of the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. This is continued in Isaiah 26. It says, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers. Shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. Those are the plagues and the turmoil. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth shall also, also shall disclose her blood and, no, and shall no more cover her slain. The people on earth will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. And why will the, 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 the dead, or what they call the, the earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain? Why will the earth not be able to cover her slain? Because there won't be anybody to bury anybody. This is the problem. It's not a second chance gospel. You get your chance and you've got to use it. Some people will only get one chance in their life to hear this truth. And it might be in your hands if they find that or get that opportunity. This is a very serious calling. The Lord is calling you to acknowledge and understand that there's a final confrontation coming to, coming to a head here. But if you stand on the side of Christ, you'll be part of the 144,000. And there's nothing secret about that day as it explains in Matthew 24 verse 27. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. There's going to be a day that will be never forgotten in the history of the universe. Psalms 110 verse 5 and 6. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of His wrath. He shall judge among the nations and he shall fill the places with bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. Can you imagine sitting in the seat of parliament as a head of a country? The responsibility that you have. God's calling you if you are one of these high ups in one of these political systems or in business. He's calling you. He says, please be careful. Wherever you are, understand that this is all about worship. This is about worshipping the dragon. Even if you're not worshipping him directly, bowing down somehow, somehow he's got you. The only way to be secure and safe is to come out and be separate and stand with this group that are going to take the persecution at the end time. Revelation 18 is a book that I recommend that you read. Take the time, open your Bible, Revelation 18. Keep the new Bible next to the King James Version and read both of them so that you understand in depth what's going to happen. Babylon, the world, has become a habitation of every foul spirit and the cage of every foul bird. The Lord is calling us to be unified in truth. The world is calling us to be unified in error. This will all come to a head in the next lecture.